In this video, I'm going to show you how to get NES emulation up and running on the PC version of Retroarc using the Nestopia Core. Ah, the NES. So many great emulation options exist for this system, and Retroarc is host to a number of them. So this is yet another video on NES emulation using the PC version of Retroarc. Now, just to be upfront, NES emulation isn't that complicated to get set up, so it should be relatively simple for anyone new or old to the emulation scene. But let's go ahead and dive in. So to get started with NES emulation on the PC version of RetroArch, you just need to get the PC version of RetroArch installed. So I have two guides on my channel on how to do so. Link to this playlist will be in the description below for anyone interested in checking it out. But it'll show you how to get the program installed, set up, and a number of great optional configuration settings you might be interested in. So again, Link in the description below to this playlist, you can check it out for standalone or Steam version. Now, the only thing required for NES emulation is just to acquire NES games. So if you happen to have a large physical collection of NES games and are interested in dumping those to use in emulation, you could get something like the Retro Blaster Programmer from Retro Stage, and you were able to dump those games directly to your PC to use in emulation. It's the option I use, it's a great one. There's also numerous other hardware dumpers out there you can check out. Or, as always, you can resort to Google and do things that way. I really don't care how you do it, just don't ask me for illegal download links because they will not be provided. But NES games should be in just a standard NES file extension, or you could zip them up if you want to save on space, but NES games are relatively tiny, so I've never really bothered zipping them up personally. But, whatever you want to do, go for it. But once you have your game sourced, you just need to put them anywhere on your hard drive. It doesn't matter where they go, so for my demonstration purposes, I'm just going to add them to my RetroArch Games folder, inside my demonstration folder here. And with those games in place, we are ready to download the Nestopia course. We can run them, so just go ahead and boot into RetroArch. From the main menu, head to the online updater and press enter on your keyboard. Go into the core downloader. And now on your keyboard or controller, press the right key, right arrow key or right on the D-pad to scroll down to Nintendo. And look for NES Famicom Nestopia UE, and then you can press enter to download it. And once that core has been downloaded, we are ready to begin loading up NES content. So you can just back out to the main menu. And one method of doing so is to go to load content, navigate to the directory where you have your game stored. So for the desktop, it's users, desktop, there we go. And then you can just select a game. And if you have multiple cores, you'll choose the core and it will load up. Personally, I'm not a big fan of that method. It's a little long-winded, so what I like to do instead is make a games playlist. So the way that I like to do this on the PC version of RetroArch is to use the desktop menu. So on the main menu here, you can see the show desktop menu button here. You can click to open it, or you can just press F5 on your keyboard to launch it. Now over on the left, you'll see the content browser in the desktop menu here. I already have a Nintendo playlist from when I made one for my Messen tutorial. But if you want to make a new playlist, just right click in the white space here and type in Nintendo, space dash space, Nintendo Entertainment System. And that'll give you a new playlist entry here on the left that says Nintendo, Nintendo Entertainment System. It has a Famicom logo, it's cool. So it just overwrote the one that I already had, that's perfect. So, but go ahead and get it selected. Now in the main white box here, just right click add folder and navigate to the directory where you have your NES game stored. So there we go, select that. And then for core, you could choose your Nestopia core, database, Nintendo Entertainment System, and then press OK and it should find you all of your games that are in that folder. And since I already had thumbnails downloaded from my previous tutorial, it's already popping those up. But if you wanna download thumbnails for your system, you can right click on the playlist entry Go to download all thumbnails, this playlist. It will go through and try to find all the thumbnails in its database for any matches that it finds. So games need to be named in a specific way for it to find matches typically. It's usually the game name followed by a region code. So if your games are just named after the game, chances are it might not find anything. But if they are named correctly, you should have a box art populate that section of the screen. But of course there are certain games that it might not find something for. So for example, Al was Awakening here. So for Owl's Awakening, it won't find a box art by default because it is a recent NES homebrew release. So you can manually add in box arts for any games that you want that don't get thumbnails automatically pretty easily. All you need to do is find a box art for the game in question. So you can use Google 
or go to the GameFAQs uh, media section for the game in question, and you should find a box art. And the box arts just need to be in .png format to be added into RetroArch. So to do so is quite simple. Just select the game that you want to add the box art to in the desktop menu. So Alice Awakening for me. And you'll notice the box art section down here. So you just drag the, the picture right on and it'll apply it. And there we go. All done. If you find images that are in JPEG format and you want to convert them over to PNG, it's pretty simple as well. You can just open up Paint. Drag a picture in, and then save it as the proper format, so PNG. But once you have your playlist set up and prettied up the way you want, you can just go ahead and close out of the desktop menu. Press F on your keyboard to go back into RetroArch's full screen mode. And then to get your new NES playlist to show up on the left, just click on the Restart RetroArch button here at the bottom of the main menu. And once that restart has taken effect, you'll have a new NES playlist on the left, all of your games listed, and box art showing on the right if you added them. But then to play a game, all you need to do is select it and tell it to run. And there we go, NES emulation up and running on the PC version of RetroArch using the Nestopia Core. So this is probably my preferred NES Core personally over Messen. Messen has cool features like HD texture packs and things like that, but I think that the Nestopia Core runs a little bit better personally. At least for the games that I've played. It is also the better choice if you want to do light gun emulation, as Messen doesn't have light gun crosshairs implemented, so it makes it difficult to actually enjoy light gun games to their fullest. But with this setup out of the way, you should be able to enjoy an overwhelming majority of the NES library. But this being emulation, there are a number of things that we could change within the emulator settings, so at this point we are going to cover the core options available to us within Nestopia. So to access your core options, press F1 on your keyboard to go into the quick menu. And then from here, go down to core options. And our first set of options are in the system tab here. And first up, system region, set to auto by default, and that should work for an overwhelming majority of things. But if you want to manually select a region, you can do so here. Next, Famicom Disk System Auto Insert. So we aren't covering Famicom Disk System in this tutorial. If you want to do Famicom Disk System stuff, you just add a BIOS to your RetroArch system folder, and those games should load up. I don't own any Famicom Disk System stuff, so I am not specifically covering it. But you will want to leave this option on if you are using it. Next up, video. So, Blarg NTSC Filter. These are essentially built-in shader effects that you can apply to your games. And the results are pretty solid, so here's a composite filter for it, and you can see that it applies a lot of blurring, some screen shake. S-Video clears it up a little bit, but still looks pretty good for a S-Video filter. RGB SCART, so this is very reminiscent of what my NES looks like hooked up to the RetroTINK. And then, of course, good old black and white. So, if you played NES games in black and white back in the day, you can still do it now, and it's pretty cool. So, these built-in shaders are pretty awesome, but you can also use RetroArch's own shader system to apply a number of these same effects. So, just choose which works best for you. Alright, next up, color palette. So, this is set to the Sony CXA2025AS by default in Nestopia, and this one just happens to be my personal favorite. I think it gives really deep colors, I just really like it, but the NES didn't actually have a standard color palette. It kind of just depended on your TV what games were going to look like. So you could go through and choose a number of different color palettes. So the CXA is my favorite, but all the stuff from Firebrand X is also really well done. So again, it's a personal preference option here, so go ahead and choose whichever one you like best. But just as a little example, here's... Firebrand X's composite one, PVM, NTSC, and then NES Classic versus the CXA, which is my preferred. I just like these richer colors. Next, we have a couple of overscan options, so masking the overscan on the vertical and horizontal axis. So this will just get, get rid of some garbage data on the sides of your screen so you don't have to see it if you don't want it. So you can just apply it on a game-by-game -game basis if needed. Not all games have garbage data. So, really be a game-by-game -game option for that one. 
Next up, preferred aspect ratio. This is set to auto by default, and that should work for most use cases. But if you want to set a manual aspect ratio, you could do so here. So for example, you could just do a four by three stretching, go for a PAL region five by four aspect ratio, or uncorrected aspect ratios. This is gonna be your typical eight by seven, I believe. So I prefer four by three personally, so you could just go ahead and set this however you want. Again, it's all personal preference. Isn't it great to have choices? Next up, the audio tab. So our first option here, Game Genie Sound Distortion. If you used to use the Game Genie back in the day, it would cause your games to have a bit of a distorted sound. So you can mimic that effect in emulation with Nestopia. Next up, Show Advanced Audio Settings. So this is a menu reopen item here. So if you enable the option, press F1 on your keyboard, and then F1 again to open it up, and you're able to adjust all of the individual volume levels for all of these various sound channels. So this is going to be for the true NES audio file. For most basic use cases, you're not gonna need to mess with any of this stuff. And then if you wanna get rid of that menu, you could just turn the option off, open it and close it, or close it and open it again. But there we go. All right, next up, input. First up, four player adapters. So there are a select few NES games that had four player compatibility and it should work by default. But if for whatever reason it doesn't, you can change the adapter for your system manually here. Next, shift buttons clockwise. So by default, the NES's A button is on an Xbox controller's B button, and then the B button is on the A button. It can feel a little awkward and unergonomic in the here and now, so if you wanna have an experience that's a little bit more comfortable, you can turn on shift buttons clockwise, and this will make it so that the A button is A and the B button is X. So a little more natural thumb placement, but not quite accurate to a real NES experience. And then of course the turbo buttons will shift to B and Y. Next up, Arkanoid device this is set to mouse by default. The pointer can be a tad bit slower than the mouse, so you could go ahead and choose between them, see what works best for your needs. Next up, Zapper device. This is kind of the same thing as Arkanoid device. It's set to light gun by default. This is a bit slower on movement with your mouse. Then you could change to mouse and get the full DPI of your mouse. It can make it a little sensitive. And then the pointer option, I think, is probably the best one for my use case. Again, this is going to be on a system-by-system -system basis, how these perform. So go through them and try them all out. But pointer worked the best in my use case. Next, show crosshair. You want to leave this one on if you want to be able to see what you're aiming at in light gun games. And finally, turbo pulse speed. This is set to two by default, so if you want faster turbo functionality, you can just crank the number up. And our last menu option here is emulation hacks. So first up, we can remove the sprite limit that was present on the NES system. So if it's the NES put more sprites on screen, it can only handle so many per scan line and it would cause flickering if that number was exceeded. So for those of you that have been longtime NES players, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You could turn this option on to remove that flickering effect. Next, CPU speed. This is an emulated CPU overclock setting. So for games that get massive slowdown when more enemies appear on screen, you can increase the CPU speed overclock to overcome it. So for example, turning this option on in Mega Man will make it so that there is virtually no slowdown throughout the entire game. But if you want the authentic experience, you will want to leave this off. And lastly, RAM power on state. So 0x00 is the default setting. This is just your cleared memory, and it'll get let you play your games like you normally would. If you want to experiment with some of the interesting glitches that can happen in NES games depending on the RAM state, you can set it to 0xff or a random value. Again, this is essentially glitching out games to make weird things happen. So not really needed, but fun to mess with from time to time. And that's going to do it for our core options. So as always, if there are certain settings you want to set for some games but not others, you can head up to Manage Core Options and save them as a Game Options file. So that way, every time you load up that specific game, those options will greet you and not affect any of your other NES games. And then for just those of you that were curious about light gun games, here it is working automatically with uh, Duck Hunt here. So we have the crosshair on screen. I chose that pointer option, so it makes it really easy to move around and maneuver in the game. So... Just a great way to emulate light gun games with Nestopia. But speaking of light gun, it's kind of important to go into the control tab here and see what options are available to you. 
So in port 1 controls, the device type is set to auto and that should work for almost everything. On player 1, you can only really set it as a gamepad. But on port 2, we get a number of different devices available to us including gamepad, the arkanoid pad, or the zapper. So as you can see from this example on Duck Hunt, it automatically selected the zapper. So auto should work for most things, but in the rare case that it doesn't, you can manually select the controller you need right here. Now, one last thing I want to talk about real quick before we call this video good is shaders. So RetroArch shaders are a powerful way to adjust the way that your NES games will look. That being said, there is no such thing as a perfect shader, so it's just all going to be personal preference on this, but you can come into the shaders tab, enable the shaders if they aren't already, make sure you have downloaded shaders from the online updater before getting started, but then you can just load up a shader, and I like to use CRT Easy Mode personally. I think this is one of my favorite shaders. It just gives a nice, basic CRT look, good grid lines, and just, it, it does a good job at what it does. And it looks great on native resolution content as well as upscaled content. So I'm just a big fan of this one. There are way more advanced shaders available, but again, it's all personal preference. There's no such thing as the best once again. So once you find a shader that you like, just go back into the Shaders tab, Click on the save button and then save them as a core preset so that way every time you load up an NES game, that's the shader that's going to greet you. But that's going to do it for NES emulation using the Nestopia core. Again, this is probably my favorite NES core. It just runs really well, has better functionality for light gun games, but unfortunately it does miss out on the HD texture packs that Messin provides. But thankfully, you're able to use multiple cores for everything that you could do with NES emulation. So if you want to have NES texture packs for some games and then use all your light gun games in Nestopia, like, hey, there you go. You could do both. That is a very valid option. But thank you so much, as always, for watching today's tutorial. I hope it helps you get your NES emulation projects up and running to your liking. Now, here at the end of the video, I do have a couple of big favors to ask. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to hit that like-dislike button, depending on how much you like this video, as well as the sub and notification bell so you can see when new content goes live on the channel. I have loads of content coming your way, and I'd love to have each and every one of you along for the ride. For anyone interested in further helping support the channel, you can also check out that join button here on YouTube or the Patreon link in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. A little goes a long way to keeping this place up and running and bringing all of this content to you. I am super grateful to all of my current backers. Y'all are amazing. Thank you for being such rock stars and champions. But until next time, my wonderful internet peeps, you all stay awesome, keep on gaming, and we'll see you back next video.